Welcome to our, our Friday Brexit series for the Center for the Study of Europe. My name is Kaya Schilde. I'm the uh, acting director of the center and I'm a professor of international relations at the Pardee School for Global Studies. Today we have a wonderful talk titled Empire 2.0, Global Britain, Little England, question mark. Um, Brexit, Britain's international role and the English question with Professor Thomas Audy. He is a professor of diplomatic history at the University of East Anglia. He's also an expert on great power politics from 1500 to 2000. He has published uh, at least 20 books, including July Crisis, The World's Descent into War, Summer 1914, and also Statesman of Europe, The Life of Sir Edward Gray, which was the New Statesman Book of the Year in History category from last year. He's currently a Leverhulme Major Research Fellow and is completing a book on British foreign policy from 1650 to the present. He's a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society and elected member of the Society's Council. He's been an advisor to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And so with that, Professor Adi. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for this kind uh, introduction. And thank you for in inviting me um, to speak to you. My, my only regret really is that I can't do that in person. Um, Boston's one of my favorite places in, in North America and it would be rather nice to be there, especially at this time of the year. Um, at any rate, uh, my focus today is going to be largely on foreign policy and Britain's place in the world. And I thought I'd um, start off by making three points that I think are all interlinked. Um, and they speak to the uh, issue of uh, Brexit in general, but also to um, Britain's international position. And the, the first point I would like to make is that Brexit was not inevitable. Um, there should not be a sort of implied teleology of Brexit. The situation in 2016 and the situation between 2016 and 2019, 2020 was highly contingent and a whole range of different outcomes uh, was perfectly possible. This links me to a, a second point. Um, Brexit is not an event. Um, the slogan, get Brexit done, was always highly misleading. Brexit is, I think, best understood as a process. Uh, and a process that hasn't been terminated with Britain's formal leaving of institutionalized Europe. It's a process that's still ongoing. See, for instance, the Northern Ireland um, negotiations, but also the still to be decided um, framework for security cooperation uh, or uh, future trading arrangements. And thirdly, I would counsel against placing an exaggerated interpretation on Brexit. In 2016, Britain was a, how shall I put it, semi-detached member of the European Union. Now, after 2020, uh, we are detached from the European Union, but for reasons of geography, history, um, security, common security, trade and prosperity, uh, this country needs to have very close relations with Europe. So the awkward relationship with Europe will simply continue. The process of Brexit is ongoing. Now, if all of that sounds a little reminiscent of Giuseppe Lampedusa's leper, remember, you know, everything, uh, everything changes so that, uh, sorry, everything changes so that everything stays the same. Let me say that it, in at least one respect, uh, Brexit does mark um, a significant change, and that is that in foreign policy terms, uh, Britain, in at least the short term, and maybe for the foreseeable future, um, is a disruptive element in international politics. And that's a significant change because really since, well, where do you start, 1688 or 1714, um, Britain had always acted as a, or at least tried to act as a stabilizing and consolidating uh, factor in international politics. Of course, mistakes were made, but the aim was always uh, to, to uh, act as a stabilizing 
uh, influence, and that has changed. So in terms of foreign policy, then, how does Brexit fit into um, um, uh, foreign policy? Um, at the risk of sounding a little too cliché, but I thought I'd start with the, the quote that you all know, uh, Dean Acheson's 1962 comment um, about Britain having lost an empire and uh, not having discovered her new role yet. Um, there was some truth in that comment, of course, and that's perhaps why it hurt so much at the time. I think where Acheson was actually wrong was in that he started with 1945. In fact, you can go back to the middle of the 19th century and what you will actually see is that British foreign policy was essentially about um, adapting this country to a situation where its influence diminished gradually. This process was accelerated by two world wars and the uh, subsequent problems that these uh, generated. Now, I think there's nothing wrong or ignoble about a great power seeking to preserve its power and influence uh, in uh, a declining great power, seeking to preserve its uh, power and uh, influence uh, to punch above its weight, which was a phrase beloved by um, British prime ministers and foreign secretaries in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, but in the British case, that process of adaptation was fraught and uh, prolix. And it seems to me that as with foreign policy in the 19th and early 20th century, it was very often a matter of selective uh, engagement. And that also is the case with uh, dealing with Europe. Uh, and you all know the story about the Messina talks and missing uh, the beginning uh, of the process of European uh, integration. But here already you can see that this is very much about uh, trying to have a way in without actually belonging to an institutionalized uh, form of European organization. Anthony Eden, the prime minister in the mid 1950s said when it came to a European federation, um, he said, we know in our bones that we could not uh, we could not join. Now, Suez, of course, um, showed up the fragility of the geometry of uh, Britain's uh, global position. And this set in train a whole um, uh, sequence of internal deliberations about how uh, best to adapt Britain to um, the new international environment. When you go back to the tail end of the Second World War in 1944, there was a Cabinet Economic Reconstruction Committee was actually said, we have about 10 years after the end of fighting uh, to modernize Britain's economy. After about 10 years, other countries will have caught up and we will have lost whatever advantage um, might accrue from actually having modernized before uh, they do. And that was a very prescient um, observation in back in 1944. When you look at the uh, period between 1950 and 1970, you see that Britain's uh, share of the global economy steadily declined. In 1950, um, Britain's share of um, manufactured uh, exports was uh, more than a quarter. It stood at 25.5%. By 1970, it had declined to just a little over 10%. At the same time, West German exports rose to about a fifth of global uh, exports, and they remained there. And the French, uh, I think, reached levels between 14 and 15 percent. So Britain was falling behind all the other European nations, um, and she couldn't really counterbalance this with um, income from her uh, uh, invisible uh, trade. Now, that's, this was possible in the 19th century. But um, in the 19th century, Britain's share of invisible trade uh, in the global economy was about a third, uh, and this had sunk to 5% in 1960. So Britain's economic position was much worse than that of many of the other European uh, powers, and this had enormous implications for Britain's ability to maintain her military position um, as one of the big nuclear powers. 
Um, and and it's, it's really the, the nuclear relationship with the United States and um, the uh, attempts to get into Europe that I think one needs to see in, in connection. Um, and this becomes particularly uh, noticeable uh, once Harold Macmillan took over as a prime minister. He was very keen on developing um, the nuclear relationship uh, with uh, the United States and to resurrect the, the so-called special relationship with uh, America based on privilege British access. And of course, I, you've heard this before. Uh, I think Scott Lucas has spoken very eloquently about uh, how uh, the special relationship um, is a, a rather one-sided arrangement. Uh, uh, I think Helmut Schmidt, uh, the uh, former West German Chancellor, had it absolutely right when he said that the special relationship is so special that only one side knows that, that it exists. And that is, of course, Great Britain. Only small powers have special relationships. Uh, great powers, superpowers don't. Um, now, for Macmillan, having access to nuclear technology and having an independent nuclear deterrence that was essentially uh, dependent on American technological and political support um, was uh, key to maintaining Britain's international position. And he tried to use that uh, nuclear position to uh, gain access to the uh, European economic community as it was in those days, the common market. And he saw Britain joining the European Six as a way of, um, of, of securing a larger transatlantic uh, community. And that, of course, was precisely what uh, spooked General de Gaulle you know all about the famous non in uh, 1963. Uh, effectively, he had um, called Britain's bluff, and the the adjustment uh, to the altered uh, conditions of the post 1945 or post 1941 really uh, world um, still had to uh, continue. There was a second attempt. Uh, this uh, failed as well, and then. In the 1970s, early 1970s, the conditions were much more uh, favorable. West Germany was now a power to be reckoned with. Uh, de Gaulle was gone in Paris, and the French wanted to have a counterweight to the Germans. The Germans wanted to have a counterweight to the French. And so um, Britain's uh, renewed application uh, um, actually coincided with uh, changed perspectives and interests on the continent uh, of Europe. Now, Heath was very deeply committed to the idea of Europe. This is a generational uh, matter. He lived through the 1930s and he was determined that Europe would not go through the, um, the, the horrors of fascism versus communism and world war uh, again. And organizing Europe was uh, a way of achieving that. Um, but Heath was not a sort of wide-eyed uh, Euro-federalist fanatic, as has often, or well, has often been uh, suggested by by Europhobe uh, commentators. He was a, a realist, I should say. Um, and when you look at the 1971 White Paper, which the government produced in order to justify the case for joining, it is very much a geopolitical case. This is a strategy of national revival. Without joining uh, Europe, Britain's position in the world would be in danger. Uh, and so that is very much the argument that he uh, propounded. The negotiations were successful. Britain joined in uh, January 1973. And yet the terms on which Britain joined were not altogether uh, favorable. Um, the common market that Britain joined uh, was effectively the product of the compromises that um, the founding six had made since 1957. And these compromises reflected their particular interests. Um, and this was particularly uh, awkward for Britain in the sector of agriculture and in terms of Britain's contribution to the common budget. Uh, BBQ in Brussels speak, uh, the 
British budgetary question, or as it was more commonly known as the, the bloody British question. Um, but also Britain joined against the backdrop of a global recession, the oil crisis and high inflation. All of this combined to uh, produce the phenomenon of stagflation. And so it was very easy to attach the economic problems that Britain had to the fact that Britain was now uh, in the European uh, common market. There were mistakes that the British government had made. Uh, Heath Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, generated a boom, a credit boom, a cheap credit boom in 1972 that went bust at the beginning of 1973. Uh, and this exacerbated uh, Britain's economic um, problems. And so, um, although um, a referendum in 1975 uh, sanctioned uh, Britain's joining the common market, as an authoritative study of the 1975 referendum campaign concluded, support for Europe was wide, but it was not deep. And that, I think, was always a problem uh, for British uh, governments. And especially the budget question meant that Britain was very often a break on uh, European um, uh, debates about the future development of the common market. Um, now, Although Margaret Thatcher in the end settled the, the budget question, but when it actually came to European matters, the Iron Lady, I think, was made of much softer alloy than her rhetoric and her, her public persona uh, seemed to uh, suggest. And also she was in many ways quite a constructive uh, European uh, politician. Um, the single market was very much a British creation and Lord Cofield, her uh, special envoy, was instrumental to establishing um, the uh, single market and actually establishing the, the legal framework for consolidating the various practices in, in one um, uh, framework. Um, the problem for uh, Mrs. Thatcher was that having initiated the creation of the single market, uh, she now found herself confronted uh, with a, a process that she could no longer control. But once you have a single market, you need to have standardized, standardized uh, practices, uh, common consumer protection, um, maybe common VAT arrangements, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, the free market doesn't look all that free anymore. So I don't think she quite understood um, what um, she had um, that started there. Also, the settlement of the budget question, uh, securing a rebate, uh, had soured relations with the two big other powers in Europe, uh, France and West Germany, and it had entrenched a nationalist, europhobe uh, undercurrent in the British media and in uh, British public uh, opinion. And yet, single market, the creation of the single market, the development of the single market, uh, and then the eastward expansion of Europe after 1989, 1990. On all these points, I think you will find that there's a very strong line of continuity from Margaret Thatcher to her conservative successor, John Major, and on to his successor, uh, Labour's uh, Tony Blair. Um, Looking back, it seems to me that the years between 1991 and 2016 really marked the culmination of a strategy that had underpinned British foreign policy since at least the 19, late 1950s, firmly, if not always comfortably, anchored in um, Europe and using Britain's privileged position in Washington. Um, this was used to punch above our weight. Britain appeared to be the pivotal power, as Tony Blair said, in November 1999, able to restrain the unilateralist um, reflexes of the sole remaining superpower, and at the same time able to shape um, the, the contours of Europe in a way that suited British interests. 
And of course, Britain's, sorry, America's overreach in the early 2000s then also showed up the limitations of Britain's uh, influence. And Europe all of a sudden began to emerge as the unlikely source of domestic dissatisfaction in this country. Um, and the ties with Europe all of a sudden became the point of impact between a past which Britain couldn't shake off and a European future which seemingly Britain could not avoid. And this tension was apparent in 1991, for instance, at the time of the Maastricht negotiations. Um, and I didn't want to go through all the ins and outs of the Maastricht negotiations and John Major's uh, constant fight with his own uh, party. But the point here is that the opt-outs, so-called opt-outs that John Major uh, secured and which he then presented to the British public as game set and match for Britain, in fact, marked the beginning of a loosening of especially conservative engagement uh, with Europe. Um, and it, be, it marked the beginning of the party's obsession with Europe. And just as a curious aside, um, Eurosceptics and the Conservative Party always called it Europe. It was never Europe, it was with Europe. Just as the, as the Whigs in the 19th century spoke of the constitution, but not the constitution. Um, so uh, for Euro folks always refer to Europe. Um, now, Europe in many ways was a, a, a political football. So in the 1970s, the Conservatives were much more pro-European, Labour much more Eurosceptic. By the 1990s, it was the other way around. Labour became much more pro-European. Once uh, the party had understood that uh, Europe was not a capitalist conspiracy, but actually had a very strong social policy uh, dimension. Then you have a currency crisis in 1992, and this really sealed the fate of John Major's government, and it um, sowed the seeds also of the, the Brexit um, development uh, later in uh, uh, 20 or more uh, years uh, later. Now, Tony Blair, of course, famously pronounced or uh, proclaimed a, a new dawn uh, when he was elected, and in some respects that's true. Um, but also, there was a good deal more continuity with John Major than perhaps his rhetoric uh, suggested. He dropped some of the conservative uh, demands. He did not stop others from pressing ahead with their uh, initiatives, but he had his own red lines and he secured his own uh, opt-outs. But Britain was very successful in those years in shaping the internal market and it worked as an antidote to the dirigist uh, tendencies that were strong, especially in, in France. Um, and he also sort of deepened uh, defense relations with, um, with uh, France. Um, then we come to Iraq. Uh, and of course, this is the moment when things start going wrong uh, for Tony Blair and his uh, strategy. There was a very strong moral overtone to his policy. I think he was genuinely convinced of the case for intervention and he believed that the intelligence was accurate. But there was also a hard realpolitik calculation at the core of his policy. He wanted to prevent the United States from lashing out uh, unilaterally. But Iraq also marks the beginning of the slow retreat of um, Britain. Existing ties with America and with Europe could not be held together uh, any longer. And there is a sort of an irony about Tony Blair. Tony Blair, in a sense, was a liberal interventionist. He reflected the, you remember, as the, the end of history ideas of the, the early mid 1990s. And he now found himself having to work together with neoconservatives who had very different ideas. They had the same target, but their ultimate objective was very different. At neocon Vulcans, well, they couldn't be turned into good liberal, liberal citizens um, by any stretch of the imagination. And also the context, the international context had by now changed. 
Russia was becoming a revanchist and disruptive element, and China was reverting to her own imperial um, traditions. And so I think this is the tragedy of Tony Blair. He actually perfected the foreign policy strategy that successive prime ministers and foreign secretaries have tried to perfect, which is to use influence in Washington and in Europe to leverage British influence uh, in the world at a time when the conditions that make this possible were changing and now uh, made it impossible to continue um, that uh, strategy. And the contraction of British influence actually gathered pace after 2010 uh, under the um, David Cameron led coalition uh, government. In part, that has to do with um, the austerity measures excuse me, uh, of this government. Uh, the defense budget was cut by 15%. The foreign office budget was halved uh, in that period. Um, and um, uh, Britain's uh, involvement in international uh, affairs steadily uh, uh, shrank. Uh, David Cameron was not, so, was not particularly interested in, in international politics. The world uh, was to him, you know, the place where you went on holiday, uh, but otherwise you could ignore it. Um, when he developed an interest in foreign policy problems and intervening, such as in Libya, for instance, this was of short duration, and uh, he quickly turned his attention to other matters. Um, and also, of course, the mood in the country had changed. In 2013, the House of Commons voted against um, um, military action in Syria after the Assad regime had used chemical weapons, and that constrained uh, Cameron as well. When it comes to Europe, um, he had famously said when opposition leader that his party should stop banging on about Europe because it made the party unpopular. Well, when things got difficult for him, uh, he reverted to type and he was banging on about Europe as well. And he was constantly seeking to appease um, his uh, uh, obstreperous right-wing, uh, Europhobe right-wing. Um, so for instance, in 2009, he took the Conservative Party out of the European People's Party grouping in the European Parliament, just as Remain center-right Christian Democrat Conservative grouping uh, in um, Europe. And really, um, although he was, you talk to any diplomat uh, of that period, they will all tell you that he played quite a constructive role in most of the uh, summits. At heart, he was a Eurosceptic, and he certainly used very Eurosceptic um, rhetoric. And the party was really dominated by Eurosceptics now. So in order to allay the European ghost, he uh, agreed to a, an in-out referendum in uh, 2013, um, and he never actually expected to have to uh, live up to these promises. He didn't think that he was going to win the 2015 um, general election. Now, by now, immigration had actually become um, a neuralgic point in British domestic politics. Uh, you've all heard about, um, I don't know, Polish plumbers and ch cherry pickers and so on. Uh, that wasn't a problem in the boom years around 2000. It was rather different after the global financial crisis in 2008-9. Um, and he now uh, ran up against uh, people who played to uh, a blend of nostalgia, exceptionalism, uh, and insecurity, uh, all dressed up in the banner of sovereignty. And that found a particular echo, especially in provincial England. And when you look at the 2016 uh, referendum result, you will find that um, the country was split, not just between the different nations of the United Kingdom, but especially in England. Uh, there's a very strong uh, divide between classes, between education, between the big urban areas and the provinces. Um, now, Cameron, because he had taken the Conservative Party out of the EPP in the European Parliament, now didn't have any back channels to especially Angela Merkel uh, 
the uh, German Chancellor, whose Christian Democrats dominated the EPP. Uh, and so it was very difficult for him to uh, get a deal with her. He constantly misread her role in Europe and Germany's role uh, in Europe. The concessions which he actually secured prior to the referendum were not insignificant. Um, true, the Europeans could have offered more than they did, um, but certainly uh, this was not a new settlement of the kind that Cameron had uh, promised um, his party and um, uh, the voters. And so we come to the sort of really odd thing about 2016. No one had advocated more enthusiastically the creation of a single market than Britain. No one had pressed more consistently for the eastward expansion of the EU than Britain. And no country had shaped the single market more than Great Britain. And yet the successes on all these uh, fronts undermined the popular support for um, membership of the EU. So leaving the EU in, in between 2016 and 2020 uh, also marks a seismic shift in uh, foreign policy. It upends the economic model on which Britain had based um, her whole commerce and finance and, and so on for the past uh, 40 years. But there was no clarity on the terms of leaving or the nature of Britain's future relations. Empire 2.0, Kanzuk, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, uh, etc. All of these were touted at the time, but really this was um, nostalgia dressed up as geopolitics. There was very little substance to this. And in fact, it seems to me that Brexit was an empty project, just as Boris Johnson's politics are essentially empty for him. Brexit was just a means to an end. He didn't expect to win the referendum. It was just a way for him to sharpen his leadership credentials and to ensure that he could succeed David Cameron as leader, ultimately. And so Britain joined in 1973 under very uh, unfavorable circumstances, and now she is launching herself uh, on a highly unstable and insecure uh, world. I don't want to talk about too much um, about the um, negotiations that the Theresa May government and then the Boris Johnson government led with the uh, European uh, Commission. There was a good deal of confusion about means and ends. I would very strongly recommend to you the reflections by Sir Ivan Rob uh, Rogers, who was Britain's ambassador in Brussels until he resigned uh, in 2018. I think he wrote a very profound, long essay on uh, all of this. But it seems to me that on the British side, um, there was an ignorance of international affairs, there was an inattention to European politics, and there was an inability to process professional advice when given. And all of this created all kinds of delusions uh, amongst um, British uh, policymakers and uh, politicians. So in a sense, we're back where we were when Acheson made his famous comment in 1962. Um, we've lost the empire, we've lost the European role, and we are scrambling about trying to find a new role. The Anglosphere has been mentioned, Kanzuk as a sort of first pivotal step towards um, forging closer ties with English speaking countries as a new platform for British influence. All of these things have been uh, touted. There is an, an awkwardness about this. What about the non-white former members of the Commonwealth members? They're not mentioned at all in this. Um, this whole idea that a common language somehow makes people have a common outlook seems rather fanciful. Um, the interests of Canada, Australia, New Zealand gravitated in other directions. Kevin Rudd, uh, the former foreign minister and prime minister of Australia, a very mild-mannered man usually uh, used very rude language when he commented on the whole idea of Anglosphere and Kanzuk. And since this is a family uh, program, I can't possibly repeat what he said. Um, there has been a strategic defense review recently, 
Um, there has been the slightly awkwardly named AUKUS defense pact with Australia and the United States. There's a great deal of spin around that, but really it's quite clear that this much wanted tilt towards East Asia can't hide the fact that Britain can at best only play a, a secondary role in this and that um, her real um, um, security concerns and um, the most significant commercial opportunities lie in Europe. So this is a, a relationship that needs to be um, sorted out and the governor hasn't really given any thought to all of this. Um, this leads me to a number of concluding points now. Um, and I know I've used the word irony quite a lot, but it seems to me we end up in a, in a most profoundly ironic um, situation. I said at an earlier point that immigration played a very important role in the referendum campaign. Well, immigration is no longer an issue insofar as public opinion is concerned. Is public opinion seems to be much more tolerant of immigration. Um, the British public also seems to be in favor of welfare provisions that are very similar to those in continental Europe. So we are actually on the point of becoming much more social democratic mainstream European. And the prospects for a Singapore on Thames, which had driven many Brexiters in the years before 2016, has dissolved into thin air. The Johnson government has in fact embraced the idea of a, um, a strong interventionist uh, state uh, that also increases taxation. Now, Europe as an issue has devoured the uh, I ask this to about conservative leaders from Margaret Thatcher onwards. I think it's far too soon to say whether it will devour Boris Johnson as well. I suspect he will leave at a time of his own choosing and he will then give rambling and overpriced speeches at Republican conventions in the United States. But I think that certainly Brexit and Europe are at the point of devouring the Conservative Party as we have known it for the past uh, 40 years. And I'd like to end with, with this thought. Um, Edmund Burke, Reflections on the Revolution in France. We all know this quote, good order is the foundation of all good things. And this Conservative Party, this Conservative government does not seem to believe in that any longer. It's clear that they never meant to stick to the Northern Ireland agreement. There was a tweet by Dominic Cummings uh, nine days ago, 13th of October this year, in which he said that, and I quote, cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. Now, if that's your attitude, it's very difficult to see how anyone will trust Britain in the future um, to negotiate a deal in good faith. And it's very difficult to see how Britain could act as a pivotal power in any uh, uh, regional uh, setting. Sovereignty has been manipulated by uh, the Brexit supporters, but they have never really said whose sovereignty. It's clearly not the sovereignty of parliament, which they said they wanted to preserve because this parliament voted for the deal, which they now say they want to tear up. It's certainly not the sovereignty of the people which the British Constitution doesn't know anyway. Uh, the people who voted for Boris Johnson and his supposedly oven-ready um, deals, the sovereignty seems to be um, the ability for Boris Johnson and his government to say and do whatever seems to be convenient and beneficial at any given moment uh, for short-term uh, gain. And that is exactly the condition um, against which Burke had warned the idea of freedom unmoored from any kind of order. So, and of course, whom will they blame after the scapegoat of uh, Europe has been uh, destroyed? They will have to find a new scapegoat or they will have to um, ensure that friction with the EU continues permanently. But again, it seems to me that um, here um, we can see a pattern. There's friction, created by hostile rhetoric, and then there are compromises being made. Uh, so, uh, for instance, today it's being reported uh, 
that um, this whole issue of the European uh, Court of Justice, uh, that, that the British government will make concessions on that uh, when it comes to uh, Northern Ireland. So maybe we're back to Lampedusa's uh, leopard. Everything seems to have changed and yet everything is the same. And yet Britain is a much diminished force in the world. And on that note, I think I've run over by about uh, three or four minutes. I will stop. Thank you very much. Wonderful. That was that was fascinating, and I appreciated the the breadth of of the discussion. I wanted to invite my co panelists to also invite to ask some questions, and I know that Eric might have more time constraints than I do. So go ahead. So uh, about uh, the leopard uh, and remaining the same, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, British Conservative Party in all of this, uh, because you've pointed out it's the Conservative Party that's really been at the center of a lot of the Brexit story, both, in fact, getting Britain into the EU and now getting Britain out of the EU. Uh, and you know, to what extent has the leopard actually changed its spots? Uh, and you know, in this instance, is it the same Conservative Party? Because one of the things you, you skated around and other speakers in the series have touched on as well, uh, at one point, the Conservatives were the majority party in Scotland. Uh, they had a reasonable base in Wales. They now effectively have no seats in these parts of the country. They often talk about the four nations of the United Kingdom. They, of course, have no seats in Northern Ireland, where the parties have a different arrangement. So the Conservatives now seem to be an English party. And so this is issue of England versus Britain. Uh, you know, are we actually talking about an English exit rather than a Brexit uh, here? And what's happening with the Conservative Party today to look back at this big picture? Mm. Okay, you know, very good question. Um, in fact, when I when I thought about this this talk, I I I, I was tempted to call it exit, English exit from the European Union rather than Brexit. Um, and of course, support for leaving uh, the EU was stronger in 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 England than in other parts of the UK. Um, I think the Conservative Party has changed. That is the bit that has changed quite significantly. Um, and quite clearly, the Conservative Party of the 2010s uh, um, was dominated by the children of Bruges. You know, the famous Bruges speech by Margaret Thatcher in the late 19, when was it 1988, when she said, uh, we didn't roll back the frontiers of the state in, in the UK, only to see the, 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 the state encroaching again at the European level. So, in that sense, hostility uh, to Europe has become part of the DNA of the, the Conservative Party. Um, it's also become much more, um, in a sense, English nationalist. Um, I think that's very true. Um, um, Britishness is often equated with Englishness. Um, and of course, English nationalism is the, the part of British politics that is there, but it is not articulated. Um, I mean, who are the English? What is English identity? It is very difficult um, actually to, to, to define that. Um, and um, it's, um, it's a problem uh, for Britain. Uh, that's why any kind of federal solution, for instance, is simply impossible. 85% uh, of the population of this country lives in England. Well, you can't have a federal system when 85% of, of your country uh, lives in one part of that federation. Uh, you know, <laughs> just imagine 85% of the population of the United States lived in Texas. You know, you know that, 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 that has scared you, hasn't it? Um, so, um, and, and, and breaking uh, England up into uh, smaller regional entities doesn't really work either because there is no such thing as regional identity. When it might be in Yorkshire, it might be in East Anglia, but elsewhere it just simply doesn't exist. Um, so this is a this is a problem, um, and um, there has been a contraction of conservative support in in Scotland, but um, conservative support is still there because I think they and uh, uh, you know Peter. Uh, may well co co correct me on this, um, but it seems to me that they have very successfully positioned themselves as the voice of unionism and of unionist opinion 
in Scotland and their previous leader, um, Ruth Davidson, was actually a very unconservative, very unstuffy um, leader who appealed to sections of Scottish opinion to whom the Conservative Party might not have appealed uh, um, previously. The counterweight to that, of course, is Boris Johnson, and he is absolutely toxic um, in, in much of um, Scotland. Um, the Conservatives have a base in Wales as well. So uh, they're actually the second strongest party in the Welsh Senate. So um, Wales is a bit of an outlier here, I think. Um, but you're absolutely right that uh, the Conservative Party has changed. And it's very difficult to see how um, they can change back again. But I will just say this, um, and I say this through gritted teeth, as you will know, um, the Conservative Party is the most successful political party uh, in the Western world, and it has reinvented itself on so many different occasions. Um, and in a sense, I'm looking forward to the day when Priti Patel will lead the Conservative campaign to re rejoin Europe, uh, which I think may well come at some point. It may not be Priti Patel, it may be someone else. Thank you for that. Peter. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, it's uh, it's not to correct you at all. It's uh, to say that I think that the Conservative Party in Scotland has successfully positioned itself as the Unionist Party, and in fact has gained, I think, votes as a result of that. In the same way that Labour trying to position itself as a Unionist Party has led to its demise in a lot of ways. Very interestingly. Uh, but still, you know, the Conservatives are polling at about 20% at the moment, and the SNP at about 51, 52%. So it's not close. Mm. It's just not close at all. And uh, uh, the problem, as you say, is, is the Conservative Party in Westminster. And that leads me to my observation question for you or for whoever is interested. And that is that I think the Conservative Party in, uh, in the UK has got caught up in a kind of revolution on the right across, across the world, certainly a transatlantic one. In many ways, if you look at some of the positions and policies and governing practices of the Tory party today in the UK, it seems almost unrecognizable in a lot of ways to what we were used to in terms of the Conservative Party as the party of government in years gone by. You know, uh, there's something that's happened in democratic politics across the world, which has radicalized politics, particularly on the right. The Republican Party is also almost unrecognizable. And if you look across the channel at France, for example, you know, French. French politics, French right wing right -wing politics, has also been radicalized in this way, and I think Brexit is part of this in a way. And it's really interesting. I don't have a, di a, a diagnosis, much less a prescription, as to why it's happened. But it's an interesting phenomenon that, you know, right politics on the right, the center right seems to be, you know, have have kind of collapsed in on itself and politics have moved further to the right in a way that they probably haven't done on the center left, in my view. But I'm wondering what you think of, of this, and anyone, but especially you, Thomas. And thanks as well for that, that really excellent uh, talk. It was really, really good. Well, thank you. I, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, that I wasn't totally wrong in what I said about uh, Scotland. Um, and actually, I, I agree with you with much of what you said about um, a sort of revolution on the right. Uh, there has clearly been a change. And when you look at, um, you know, the, 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 the strange phenomenon of, what's his name, Eric Zemmour in, in, in France, who, who seems to be a likely contender in the presidential elections, uh, something is quite clearly happening um, um, with European or Western conservatism, uh, which has changed. Um, I think the where Britain is perhaps slightly different is that um, I'm not so sure 
that the Conservative Party has completely shaken off its, if you like, its, its Thatcherite belief system, small state, low taxation. I think there's a good deal of discomfort with what's been happening in the past two years. And in part, that has to do with COVID and, and the, um, the expansion of state activity, the support for workers, uh, you know, uh, um, on furlough, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, it also has to do with the fact that the Conservative Party has made gains in the 2019 election in previously fairly solid Labour seats in the industrial districts in the North, former industrial districts in the North. And they're now desperate to hang on to these seats and they know that uh, low taxation and small state, um, Singapore on Thames rhetoric is not going to help them to retain those seats. So it's the Tory party is in a really odd position. They have adopted Boris Johnson as their leader because he has the strange ability to connect with people um, who would not normally vote conservative. And he is, for all his bumbling eccentricity, he is a winner, or at least he has been a, a winner so far. And so they have struck a Faustian pact uh, with him and this element of disruption that he represents um, in order to win power. I think it's going to be very interesting when the um, when inflation rises further, as it is forecast to do, uh, when uh, the debt problems uh, become more severe, and when perhaps Boris Johnson is losing popularity in the country. And I think that's when we will see the real struggle for the soul of the Conservative Party. Uh, but at the moment, I think this could go either way. It could become you know, part of that Trumpish, Zemmourish, call it what you like, conservative revolution type uh, thing, or it could revert to the kind of conservative party that we've known uh, for the past 40 odd years. I mean, what connects all of those is nationalism and populism. Yeah. And to win those seats, you know, uh, the Tory party and Boris Johnson had to speak to English nationalism, which they did. And that's the connection I see. Yes, I think that's very true. Um, it's also they were very successful in persuading uh, voters that the problems created by the Cameron Osborne government were actually nothing to do with the Conservative Party, but had to do with, with other people, with immigration. I mean, take immigration, for instance. Um, and I mean, it's, it's very easy for us, you know, well-educated liberal people to sneer at um, people who feel uncomfortable with immigration. Uh, people who live, um, you know, in the leafy suburbs of Boston or in Knightsbridge and Chelsea, they, they can cope with immigration. But someone in Middlesbrough, or you know, I can't think of a, you know, poorer suburb of Boston now, uh, that would be a close equivalent, but it's much more difficult. And of course, if you're a, a Polish, um, a, a Polish uh, a, a worker who comes to live in the UK, you're not going to live in Chelsea, you're going to live in a poorer suburb. So you're, they're competing with people uh, who are, are on low salaries, who don't have the skills to compete with the effects of globalization. Now, and this is the, the, this is the, the, the really um, nasty thing, uh, I think. Um, the Labour government, um, waived the curb on immigration because they thought not many people would come in so they they got this wrong but when they realized they got it wrong they set up funding for uh poorer communities it's called the small community fund uh so to help people deal with the consequences of immigration the small communities fund was one of the first casualties of the austerity measures of the cameron osborne government and then you have mounting problems um with immigration in certain parts of the country because people can't cope. Um, and the Leave campaign very successfully uh, mobilized anti-immigrant um, um, 
uh, uh, sentiments uh, for its campaign. And so this was effectively a protest vote, uh, and it was a very successful uh, protest vote. And sorry, if I, if I could just one, one final point. Um, I, I said earlier, and, and I, you know, we look at recent opinion polls, immigration is not an issue any longer. And it's also race is not really an issue. You know, I mean, Priti Patel is the Home Secretary. She's of East, uh, East African Indian uh, descent. Uh, Rishi Sunak is of, of Indian uh, descent. Kwasi Kwarteng, the Business Secretary, is the son of Nigerian um, uh, immigrants. Uh, Saj Javid, who's the health minister, uh, is the son of a Pakistani bus driver. Um, of course, it helped that Rishi Sunak is very, very rich, and you know he was educated at Winchester and Oxford, and uh, Kwasi Kwarteng was educated at Eton and uh, Cambridge. So, I mean, class, I think, sort of comes into that uh, as well. Um, but um, so, race and immigration are actually much less of a salient issue now. It might become an issue again if Brexit doesn't deliver the sunny uplands, doesn't lead to the sunny uplands that uh, people were, uh, were promised. So I, there's, there, there, there's at least one audience question, but I wanted to ask one because it has a little bit to do with the conversation the panel has been having. And that is about the party origins of a lot of these dynamics, both in terms of entering the EU and in terms of the motivation to leave it. And also some of your comment commentary at the end that I thought was fascinating about where does sovereignty lie, um, not necessarily with the people, um, and perhaps it has been a intra-party parliamentary struggle about where sovereignty lies. I think that's fascinating. Uh, but I wanted to put a big picture frame on this about right and left-wing parties and European integration. So it was interesting when you said that a lot of left-wing parties also thought that the EU was a capitalist behemoth. Indeed, I've had people yell at me before in the past saying, how dare you study the EU? It's neoliberalism manifested or, you know, people really have a lot of feelings about these things and most of them are incorrect. They're mostly wrong, both on the right and the left. And so I'm wondering if you can stretch a little bit and, and talk about where the tipping point uh, in terms of the party's dynamic, the conservative party's dynamic might be where you would diagnose some critical junctures about how it became a reactionary party against European integration when it was not just the party that led European integration um, from the UK, but it was also, also across the continent, it was center-right parties that created European integration in the first place. Mm. Um, and Christian Democratic parties. And so it's a fascinating phenomenon that in the year 2020 or in any time in the last decade, we think of center-right or right-wing parties as, as in opposition to European integration or the European project. And also even far-right parties. Um, there is an assumption out there that far-right parties are anti-European project because the European project is supposed to be cosmopolitan and progressive or whatever you know people characterize it as whereas as a political scientist i actually think that the european project is a neutral space that could as easily be captured by far right or far left parties if it were in their interest or if they had enough of a coalition so that's more of a comment than a question but i was just fascinated in hearing your your response about that that timeline and that narrative okay good well it's a good question well actually two good questions wrapped in one, uh, which is a bit cheeky, but um, <laughs> to pick up on the last point, um, I think you're right. Uh, when you look at continental parties, it was the Christian Democrats who took the lead role in, in the European project. And of course, the fact that they're mostly rooted in political Catholicism helped them. So they had a, a common kind of civilizational understanding of what Europe actually meant. Um, which parties of the left usually didn't have because they lacked that kind of religious, perhaps, uh, dimension. Um, I think you're also right in, uh, in saying that parties of the far right are not necessarily anti-European. I mean, one of the really interesting debates, if I understand it right, um, about the far right in Germany at the moment, the alternative for, for Germany by the AfD party, is that um, there are some people who want to leave 
the EU altogether, and then there are some more moderate elements who don't like the euro, but who, who think that um, it serves German interests to remain in the EU. So it's not as clear cut, um, really, how how these these labels then project onto um, onto the the wider European uh, question. Insofar as Britain is concerned, and that was really your first uh, question, I think. Um, I think one has to bear in mind that both parties were, have always been divided on the issue. So it was never the case that the Conservatives were pro-European full stop. That was simply not true. And Edward Heath had enormous difficulties getting um, the legislation that allowed for Britain to join through the House of Commons. There was significant opposition in his own party, and he, he needed the support of Labour rebels to get this over the line. And so the Labour Party was also divided. There were some who regarded uh, Europe as a capitalist conspiracy. Uh, there were others who simply said, well, OK, uh, we are the opposition and it's the job of an opposition to oppose. The Tories are divided on this. We can oppose and we can cause difficulties for this government. Um, and then there were some who said, well, actually, no, we, the, Europe transcends party politics. We need to support this because it's in the interest of uh, this country. So as someone who I uh, was a leading Labour pro-European was Roy Jenkins, our former Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer, that's Finance Minister, um, who would later leave the Labour Party uh, and become a leader of the, the Liberal Democrat Party. Um, but he, he voted with Heath, he campaigned with Margaret Thatcher in 1975 for Britain um, being in Europe. Um, and of course, Margaret Thatcher, you, you, may, you may have seen those photographs. She, she used to wear this, this rather gaudy um, uh, jumper, which was adorned with all the, the, the flags of the, the then members of the, the uh, European uh, community. Um, so this, this, this transcended Europe, uh, party, um, uh, party politics, and both political parties were divided. But there was always a temptation for the party that was in opposition to be whatever the other party was not at that moment. Um, there was a strong nativist, exceptionalist, maybe nostalgic strand in uh, the Conservative Party. Uh, that was represented by someone like Enoch Powell, who was very strongly anti-immigrant as well. So there you have the connection between the uh, empire connection. He was also he, he, uh, he was a very strange man. He was a classicist professor turned a uh, populist rabble rouser. Uh, he'd been a professor of Greek uh, in Australia before he became a, um, a politician, um, a member of parliament. Uh, but you also have far left people, people like Tony Benn, who wanted to have a, a sort of command economy, um, a fortress Britain, um, you know, emergency economic dictatorship um, uh, in the 1970s. So um, there was always that strand in, in the Labour Party as well. The Conservatives became increasingly more anti-European after Maastricht um, because parliamentary sovereignty, which, which is an abstract legal concept, and um, which, as it is defined, is absolute. You're either sovereign or you're not, like pregnancy. You, you can't be half pregnant, you can't be half sovereign. That has always been the argument. But there was always a temptation by the conservative anti-Europeans to, as it were, worship the symbols of sovereignty, like parliament, like not being under a European court of justice, to worship those symbols and actually um, sacrifice the tools of power, the instruments of power on the altar of sovereignty. And I think that's, that's where the conservative party has gone. The Labour Party shook off those far left suspicions of Europe in the course of the 19, early 1990s, when uh, after Maastricht, when um, uh, the Europeans adopted the so-called social chapter, which enshrined social workers' rights and, and other welfare provisions. And all of a sudden you have a, uh, a French socialist who addresses the Trades Union Council in this country and says, you know, brothers, we have the same uh, the same interests and same ideas come and support us. That really is the point where the Labour Party then becomes much more pro-European. 
well, that's the membership, that's the leadership, that's not necessarily the people who vote for the Labour Party. Just as the people who vote Conservative, um, there were also people who voted Conservative in 2019, not because they actually liked Brexit or Boris Johnson, but they were absolutely petrified because the Labour Party had fallen back into bad habits and um, elected as its leader someone who was just simply not electable and, and harbored very strange, uncouth, um, sort of neo Benite, well, not even neo, it was paleo Benite um, ideas uh, about uh, um, um, uh, politics and, and economics. So it's, it's, it's not so clear cut. What is really interesting, and this speaks to the, the theme that we've, we've had earlier um, about politics being in, in flux, the Conservatives lost a by election recently in. Uh, Buckinghamshire, which is a true blue, I mean, sorry, blue, blue, uh, blue for us is conservative. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, this would be a, in, in America, this would be a deep red uh, constituency. Um, they lost the seat to um, the Liberals. They lost in local elections um, seats to the Labour Party, which the Labour Party uh, had never held. This was in David Cameron's old constituency. So there's something more fundamental happening. The Labour Party has become much more middle class. The Liberals are middle class anyway. The Conservative, uh, Conservatives are more likely to attract the votes of working class voters at the moment. So there's a, there is a churning going on um, and um, uh, it's difficult to see where this will end at the moment. And I think this, this is why it's so important to understand Brexit is an ongoing process. This affects not just British foreign policy, it also affects British politics, uh, the parties and the way in which we conduct our politics in this country. Thank you so much. And it's a perfect time to ask uh, a audience question, which was uh, to explore the causal or the original reasons or the evolution of why the media has become, has been so Europhobic? Oh God, um, in part because it sells, um, in part also um, because it serves the interest of certain media tycoons. I mean, it was very interesting to see, for instance, in the um, early 1990s when the Europeans banned British beef exports, after the so-called mad cow disease struck in this country, how uh, various tabloid papers um, launched a vitriolic anti-European campaign. This is a declaration of war against this country, et cetera, et cetera. The Americans had also banned British beef exports, but there was no campaign against America saying that you know, this was an American declaration of war. Why? Because Rupert Murdoch or Conrad Black, the owners of big newspapers, had and still have significant commercial interests in, in the US or in Australia uh, for that matter. So I think that plays a role and there's certainly a strand of elite opinion in this country that favored that kind of Singapore on Thames model. And it's one of the profound ironies that I think this is not gonna happen now. Um, that would, I think, probably the only way in which you could make Brexit work economically, not politically, and certainly not to the benefit of the people who voted for it, but that I think would be the only way you can make it work economically. And that's not going to happen now. So I think that's, that's in part the, the media um, angle on this. And British politicians connived in this. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, successive prime ministers shaped the single market, uh, pushed for eastward expansion, etc., cetera. Um, and, really turned the direction of, of, of federalism away. I mean, the high tide of federalism was turned back in the early 1990s, in the sort of late 1990s. But they never came back from Brussels and said, well, we secured a big success. They always talked about what they couldn't achieve. Um, and I think that speaks to a, I don't quite know how to put this, but it's a sort of peculiarity about this country. On the one hand, there is a, superiority, an assumption of superiority. You know, we won two world wars, we are somehow better than the, the continentals. But this is paired with a deep 
sense of insecurity. Somehow the others are always ganging up on us and they're conniving and they're doing us in and we're not smart enough to spot all the intrigues that they're weaving around us. Um, and so it's, it was really quite odd when you had foreign secretaries turning up in Brussels, the Europeans always said, oh, the British, they're Machiavellian manipulators, they're very shrewd diplomats and they always get their way. When they then returned back home, uh, the tabloid press would say, oh, it's another sellout to the Europeans. So it's, it's part, partly perhaps the, the kind of psychological condition of public opinion in this country is partly very um, hard commercial interests by some of the media uh, tycoons in this country. So that actually leads me to one of the questions I was going to ask you, and that was when you mo mentioned that the UK entered the EU at a moment of weakness and left it at a moment of weakness. And I'm just wondering if I can invite a counterfactual about what a better moment for either would have been. Well, the counterfactual for joining, of course, would be a fairly straightforward one any time before 1957. Uh, when the leadership of some European body uh, was there to be had. The problem with that, of course, was that Britain's interests outside Europe were still quite substantial. I mean, there were still bits of the empire, the ties to the Commonwealth were very real. Um, so it's not as straightforward as saying, well, it was a misjudgment not to go in at an earlier moment. But quite clearly, when you look at the measures taken by, uh, for instance, Ernest Bevin, the Labour Foreign Secretary between 1945 and 1950, I mean, he created the West European Union. He actually, I mean, he didn't want to uh, join a European body, a sort of federation of some kind. He was quite skeptical about that. He was quite anti-German in many ways. Um, but, you know, the building blocks were there and, um, I, 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 you know, if, if the British said, okay, fine, you know, before the Messina talks, we will join this, but we will not accept a supranational organization. We will accept, um, you know, corporate intergovernmental cooperation, then I think that would have been the direction in which things would have gone. That was the direction which the French wanted anyway. Um, and so that would have been a moment perhaps where Britain could have um, exercised influence uh, in Europe. It would have been a better place, but as a starting point for engagement. Leaving, um, uh, well, I don't know. Um, it was certainly not 2016, um, I think, there was no point in leaving before then. Um, you can't make an economic case for leaving. In the period between 1973 and 2015, uh, so during the period of Britain's membership of the European Union, the British economy grew by 103%. The German economy grew by, I think, 96%. And the French economy grew by 72%. So you can't say that economically, this was not good for Britain. If, hypothetically speaking, at some point in the future, the Europeans were to have said in 2025 or 2030, we really want to get serious now about a federal state, then maybe that would have been the point to say, from a position of relative strength, economically and politically and defense-wise, okay, go ahead, but we won't join you. You have to make us uh, an offer of association or loose affiliation, but we cannot join um, a federal state. So that would be my answer. You know, as always, historians are not very good at predicting the future. Uh, so uh, um, other people may have different um, hypotheticals there or counterfactuals, um, and they will be just as, as good or, or cogent as mine might be. Well, that's one of the best articulations of what a better Brexit would have looked like, um, a, a 
more strategic, better designed Brexit. Don't, please don't give me a reputation that I don't deserve. <laughs> well, I, there was a wonderful comment from Peter in the chat, and I'm I'm deciding to go over by three or four or five minutes um, and inviting Peter to speak one more time, and and then I'll close the the panel down. I'm sorry to monopolize discussion. I already had the floor a couple of weeks ago, but this has been just fascinating to me. But it, it, saw, it struck me since the very beginning and even before the, the, the vote took place in the EU referendum, that there were a couple of fundamental misconceptions about the nature of the European project, but especially the nature of the single market in the UK. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to understand that the single market, which the British did a lot to actually help create British civil servants working uh, often in Brussels is really in, at its base, a complex of international public law. It's held together by law. And that uh, is why when people start to talk about trade negotiations as being mainly about tariffs, I'm automatically very skeptical because they're not, they're about regulation and regulatory regimes and they're about law. And this seemed to not ever sink in on the British side, either in public discourse or certainly among political elites. And I think part of the reason was that most experts in international trade were, were Remainers and were profoundly alienated and sometimes cast out of the government for pointing out uncomfortable realities about, in particular, just how much flexibility there was in the European negotiating position. Because if they begin to pick apart the single market's legal basis, they begin to pull apart the single market. And that's very difficult to do. And this is why we're seeing, you know, uh, the problem over, over Northern Ireland and, and the role of the European Court of Justice, because in order to, to oversee the regulatory regime at the heart of complex trade negotiations, there has to be some kind of legal body. And for the Europe and for the single market, it's the ECJ. And this has never really sunk in uh, sufficiently in any part of the UK, it's, I think starting to now, but it was very unfortunate. And I think part of the reason was that the experts in the UK on trade were, were Remainers, <laughs> for good reason, I guess, in my opinion, I'll put, nail my colors to the mask there. And I'm wondering what people thought of this problem and if there's any solution in the future. Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Peter. I mean, this, this is what I, I, I only hinted at this when I said that Margaret Thatcher was very instrumental in getting the process of creating the single market uh, started, but actually having started the process, she couldn't control it. And I don't think that she or the leavers now actually ever understood how a market worked. They have a very 19th century cop denied free trade kind of, you know, you produce some widgets yes, and then you absolutely. export them to another country and they will simply take it. But of course, that's once you have a, a common single market, you have to have common standards, common legal procedures, processes of arbitration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then it becomes very difficult. I think the problem in this country was not only, as, as you said, Peter, that um, the trade negotiators were all Remainers. The Whitehall, the, the, the civil service in this country didn't have any trade negotiators. British trade negotiators were sitting in Brussels, they were working for the European Commission. We didn't have to negotiate trade deals with anyone that was done in Brussels. Very often and very prominently by British nationals working for the EU and usually acting in a way that was actually very um, conducive to um, uh, furthering British influence, but we didn't have that kind of expertise. And the, the Leave advocates, the so-called European research group in the Conservative Party, well, they hadn't done their research very thoroughly or properly. Um, they thought they could simply reinvent 19th century precepts and then project them onto uh, the 21st century and they simply assumed that you know people like the canadians were just waiting uh to sign a trade deal with us and take all our goods and if they'd done studied any kind of history they would have looked at joseph chamberlain and his attempt to create an imperial federation an imperial customs union and they would have said the canadians then said no 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 
um, British products are far too cheap and we don't want them and they will ruin our economy. And that hasn't changed very much. I mean, the reason may be slightly different, but it hasn't changed. Um, and so this is bad history and it's bad strategic thinking. And there is really a very poor understanding of the realities of, of international politics. Wonderful, thank you. And so I also wanted to say, I, I would failed at the beginning to say that this talk is co-sponsored with the Evergreen Lifelong Learning Program, where professionals return to university at BU. And um, this is on their behalf and sponsored and att heavily attended by Evergreen students at BU. With that said, thank you, everyone. <laughs>